Welcome to the Sober Nation FM podcast, where we're putting recovery on the map. I'm your host, Jonathan Sylvester. This show is brought to you by Sobriety Engine. Do you want to take your recovery to the next level? Do you want more support, community, and fellowship? Sobriety Engine is an incredible free online community of men and women supporting each other in their recovery. You can get a ton of great tips, resources, and guidance to help you succeed in recovery and in life. Visit sobrietyengine.com to join today. Sober Nation FM is also brought to you by Recover Health. If you're ready to get fit and start living a healthier lifestyle all while supporting your sobriety, then you can learn more about having me as your own personal fitness and nutrition coach at rcvrhealth.com. And whether you're listening to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or watching on YouTube, please share this with your friends, follow, subscribe, and leave a review. Nation, let's hop right into today's episode. Today, I'll be speaking with author William Porter. Thanks for coming on the show, William. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to start off by hearing about what your life looked like before you got sober. So where did your relationship with alcohol actually start? So I started drinking and smoking when I was about 14 or so, which I know sometimes sounds horrendously young, but in the UK, it's not unusual. Mm. Um, and I kind of was, I just was a binge drinker. And that there's a, I think it's a similar into the, in the US to a degree as well, but you go out to get drunk. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not like you just have a couple of drinks. So we would go out, me and my friends and specifically get as drunk as we possibly could. Um, so that just continued for quite a few years, to be honest. But as it does with these things, the amount I was drinking was going up and up as my tolerance increased. Um, and then I went to university, the drinking continued, and then I did the um, some courses to allow me to become a lawyer. Um, but in the UK, what you have to do is you have to do the, the academic courses and you have to get a two year training contract and they're okay. incredibly hard to come by. Mm -hmm. So while I was um, doing that, I was paralegaling, which was fairly boring, but quite well paid. So the drinking kind of continued, but I was getting quite bored just doing what we amounted to just photocopying and stuff. So I was looking for something to do outside of work. So I ended up joining the reserve battalion of the parachute regiment, which I think is akin to your national guard. Okay. So I was in that for a few years. And then when nine 11, so this is back when nine 11 happened, everything kind of changed. Cause when I joined the reserve forces hadn't actually been used in theater for, I think since, since the second world war. Oh, wow. Yeah. But with nine 11, everything changed. So mm -hmm. shortly after that 2005, I was sent out to Iraq. So I served a tour of duty out there. Wow. Came back, got married, um, and then had young children. And I think I carried on with the binge drinking, but I think a mix of kind of the military service, <laughs> married life and transition to parenthood caused all kinds of issues. And my drinking kind of went off the scale mm. in the, the binge drinking. I, I would start on a, say on Friday, mm. but then I would wake up on a Saturday and just start drinking again almost immediately. Okay. Um, and go straight through the weekend. And then, of course, as you do start having Monday off. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you're sitting around at home feeling awful with nothing else to do, you just start drinking again. So it was getting more and more extreme. Got it. Yeah. So and now you said that you started drinking around 14 or so and then, you know, skip ahead quite a few years to all these life changes that you just described, you know, uh, going into the military without planning on really going into to a war, obviously, yeah, yeah. Uh, getting married, uh, you know, and, and then of course, having kids. And, and that's really where the, the binge drinking became more apparent. But at what point did did the drinking become regular? Like, what would that have been in your college or university years? Or when was it kind of becoming more of a was it an everyday thing even before going off to Iraq? Yeah, it was, I think, because I, I don't think honestly since the age of about 14 I went a weekend without drinking because okay. it's just yeah. what people did mm -hmm. you know the weekend mm -hmm. came in and we drink so yeah I think it was virtually from the off okay. to be honest yeah okay, okay. and so you, you come home and again there's all these life changes going on and and uh, I don't want to do assume anything but I would kind of guess if it were me I go off to Iraq and just some of the things that we've heard now 
did, did you bring any of that home with you? Was there any, um, you know, I guess I'm just going to phrase it as PTSD or anything like that that was going on that was tied into the drinking? Or was it just more the, the habit and the binging that, it, um, that you kind of brought home, do you think? Uh I didn't get any specific PTSD or anything from it. And mm. I was, I was very lucky when I was out there in that it was a sure. fairly quiet tour. Okay. Um, yeah. And it, it, there was nothing massively horrendous. It was to be honest, no worse than you would see if you saw a bad car accident, which you don't have to go out for a rock for you see it every day in the U S and the UK. Mm. So it wasn't that. And funny enough, the thing I struggled with the most was coming back the military life is is very regimented you know exactly what your job is what you have to do people are very proactive if you ask them to do something it gets done by hook or by crook and then suddenly you come back and it's a struggle coming back to civilian life mm. where people <laughs> don't do things and they you know, you ask them to do something and they find a hundred reasons not to do it. And, you know, you're given a job to do, but it's not really clear delineation of responsibility. It sounds minor stuff, but it, it's a very different existence when you've been somewhere for six months. And also I found what I was doing out in Iraq was life and death stuff, but then coming back to the UK, particularly going back into a legal career, mm. it isn't. And it suddenly didn't feel very important. And so trying to engage in work, I found incredibly difficult because I just didn't care. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I, I can, I can see that. That makes a lot of sense. So now what, what was the turning point for you? I mean, you're, you're back home, you're kind of in this, you know, humdrum situation, right. Where you're just going through the motions. Don't, don't really hmm. care so much about what's going on. And, and I'm guessing uh, you start to notice probably it sounds like that the drinking is has picked up and is a little more extreme. W what starts to happen then like in relationship to the drinking? Are there more consequences or what's going on? I think, yeah, the consequences started to impact me a lot more. Um, I think it's always a bit of a turning point when you have children as well, because suddenly you can't wake up on a Saturday feeling awful and just sit around all day or stay in bed for half the day because the kids are up and you're running around after them. So I think the negative consequences start to hit you more because you're waking up in a quite a bad place and having to like you hit the ground running immediately. Um, and of course, when you're drinking at that level, it causes relationship issues. So I was having increasing problems, marital problems, um, which came to a head. It was actually, I was talking about being a, a sort of a, a weekend binge drinker, but actually I went out for a business lunch and I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday and I didn't even plan this, but I ended up drinking all afternoon and into the evening. Um, and what I was finding was when I drank, I would wake up at three or four in the morning and a few drinks would then get me back to sleep. So I would, I got into the phase of just waking up, drinking, falling back to sleep, waking up, drinking again, so sort of time ceased to have any meaning. And a two or three days into this, I just rung in sick to, from work. I, I remember waking up at night um, and every time I woke up, there was bad feeling because there'd been an argument. Most of the time I couldn't remember it. So I was lying in bed. Um, and when someone is asleep next to you, you can hear them because when people are asleep, their body relaxes and their breathing becomes slightly louder when someone's awake, they're usually more silent. So I was lying in bed and my wife was absolutely silent. So I knew she was awake and furious next to me. Mm. I didn't want to move because I didn't want to start an argument again. So I was pretending to be asleep, but eventually I had to get up to go to the toilet and I got up. And I don't know if you've ever done this where you think you're alone and you turn around and suddenly someone's right next to you and it just scares you. <laughs> I had an almost a, a complete mirror image of that in that I got up and as I looked around I realized the bedroom was empty so I walked past what was the two, the bedroom where my two boys slept and that was empty too and my wife had taken the kids and gone and I just had no memory of it um, so I woke up carried on drinking I think it went on for a few more days and then eventually it was it was crunch crunch time really I had to either quit or lose my marriage and probably lose my job as well so it was yeah 
that was the point where I had to do something about it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And so what does happen from there? Like, what does your game plan look like? How, how do you, how do you start making this, this change? Well, so it's a bit of a, I suppose, in some ways, a common story, in some ways, a slightly unusual one in mm. that I had a lot of kind of knowledge and conclusions about alcohol and how it affects people. Okay. Not all of it, but some of it. Um, but to be honest, at that point, I would love to be able to say that I focused on my family, I focused on my wife, my marriage, my job, and just pulled out this amazing thing out of the bag but all I really knew at the time I was in a, an incredibly bad way just from the amount I'd been drinking sure yeah. couldn't really string a coherent thought together let alone a sentence and I mm -hmm. just stopped drinking didn't sleep at all for the first couple of nights but just kept plodding on really mm. um, and almost pieced it together afterwards if that makes sense sure yeah okay Okay. And, and so you, you kind of dry out, so to speak. And, um, and, and then what do you do from there? Like, how do you kind of come into sobriety, so to speak? I mean, what, what does that, what does that look like initially? It's, it, it's an interesting one because I think for me, I was not in a particularly good place anyway at the time. Right. So I, obviously had marital problems I had the stuff that had happened in Iraq um, I didn't like my job our house we were, there was four of us in a two-bed house it was far too small for us plus in London property prices are so expensive so we were living somewhere kind of small anyway mm -hmm. so for a mix of reasons I wasn't particularly happy and I didn't really expect to be happy for quitting drinking I just thought this can't continue I have to stop um, so I stopped, but I suppose what, what was interesting was the degree to which these problems were being blown out of proportion by my drinking. And I think that's something I didn't really appreciate, but then I started to appreciate as I clocked up weeks and then a couple of months, as my brain chemistry got back to normal and started sleeping better and started to feel a bit more mental resilient, um, the things that seemed really overpowering when I was drinking that I would have said was what I was drinking for actually looked a bit more manageable. So I started to realize a few things about alcohol and how it affects us um, and sort of pieced it all together. And then over time, it sort of fell into place a bit more, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it's kind of leading up to your, uh, your book, or I should say your two books, uh, Alcohol Explain and, and Alcohol Explain 2, which I want to talk about in a moment. But just so I'm clear, and for our listeners as well, what were the, the tools that, that you were using, so to speak? Um, were, were there things you were reading? Were there any uh, groups you were attending? Was there any therapy or anything like that? Like what, what were you doing once you kind of started stringing together a, a little bit of time? And what, what do you feel like really helped you the most beyond if there was anything beyond just saying like, okay, this is making my problems way worse. I need to stop that. Was there anything outside of that, that, that you were using that you think helped? To be honest, I didn't use an awful lot. I, I started to go to AA for a bit mm -hmm. and I found the companionship and speaking to people phenomenally useful. Sure, yeah. But I kind of struggled a bit with the 12 steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I kind of made a start on them with a sponsor, but it didn't really work out. Um, so it didn't work particularly well. If I'm honest, I think those first few days and weeks, I just white knuckled it. And this was going back. I've just hit, just, just topped over seven years sobriety now. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and things have changed a lot in those seven years. There's an awful lot more around in just, it's a very short space of time where things have changed massively mm. from sort of a recovery perspective. Um, but it wasn't really, I think as I sort of moved a bit more into sobriety, things piece together a bit more my understanding of it which made the ultimate goal more it felt like more achievable and more worthwhile if you like yeah 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 and and uh, you know I, I feel like I mentioned this with every guest now pretty much that one of the reasons that this podcast was started was really to get some different perspective 
Um, and, and, you know, 12 step works for some people, uh, other recovery groups work for some people. And I, I think, you know, if, um, because I, you know, I'm in a 12 step program and kind of referring to that book, it talks about like different types of drinkers. Right. And, mm. um, I think if we were going to like classify you by this, if you'd allow me to, to do that yeah, yeah. momentarily, that it describes like the type of drinker that is faced with all these problems that, that you described, you know, marital issues, j- just not happy. And they're able to course correct. Um, and, and I think that's, that's so important. And I think that what we're getting to here, um, what we're going to talk about with your books, it sounds like you really got into the, I don't want to just generalize or, or kind of dumb it down with, with this, but, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, but kind of like the logical side of like, yeah. Hey, That's this exactly is, it, yeah. this is what alcohol does. And, and man, I can really appreciate that too. So let's, let's talk about the book a little bit. Alcohol explain, like, why did you decide to write this in the first place? The reason I wrote it in the first place, there was a few reasons, but having been to AA and then having quit, what I found was there was a lot of people who, when people think they've got a problem with alcohol, the first thing they're doing is asking questions like, what's happening to me? Why me? Why can't I moderate? Why can other people moderate? What All of these questions. Mm-hmm. And what I start to, started to realize was, is one that I had some of the answers to them. Um, and two, that I started to suspect that that's what had given me the key to release myself from the addiction. Got it. Um, and it was, I think for me personally, I see it that a lot of the bars on the cage of addiction are our beliefs about whatever drug we're taking. Mm. So for alcohol, and it's a hugely widespread belief, but people believe that they need alcohol to socialize. That's such a widespread belief that, you know, a night out is not so much fun if you're not drinking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. People believe that they need it to cope with stress, that it helps them unwind at the end of the day. Um, you know, it's a social lubricant. It helps you sleep. All of these things, because that's the problem we face. We, you know, we don't like what alcohol is doing to us, but we miss the social lubricant side of it. The fact that it relaxes us, that it takes the edge off stress. And I think one of the reasons taking a purely logical approach to it is so useful is because you can expel each and every one of these beliefs because actually all of these beliefs are false. Mm. And when you do that, you're moving from, so, so if you've got something that tastes good, that helps you relax, that helps you enjoy yourself, that helps you cope with stress, it's hard to stop taking it. True. But if you've got something that tastes foul, that doesn't help you sleep, that makes stress worse, that increases your anxiety, it's far easier to just have done with it. Hmm. And that's why I think it works quite well for some people. And, and going back to what you were saying, that kind of logical approach yeah, yeah. is just what clicked with me personally. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, I get that. And I think, I think that's uh, you know, I think that's really cool because although I felt like, and, and I feel like, you know, 12 steps has worked for me. I also like the logical side. Like I want to know and, and learn about these things. And I agree 100%, you know, our, belief systems or these stories, right, that we kind of tell ourselves about things can really, you know, lock us into some some bad situations, whether they're related to uh, uh, addiction or not. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm remembering early in sobriety, there being a, a guy that I went through treatment with, and we were doing kind of like an outpatient program. And one of the things that I could tell, and I talked to this guy about this one time, that I could tell just like kept screwing with him was this, you know, myth as I'm going to coin it um, that he heard about. And and I think there is, I I don't want to say myth, but this belief, if you will, this story that um, because I think there is some, some science behind this, but that it was almost impossible to get sober from meth, from methamphetamine. And that was his drug of choice. And so Mm -hmm because of that, I don't want to say it was just because of that, but he acknowledged that in large part, because of hearing that and then believing that so strongly, he just continued 
to, to struggle with that. So I, I get what you're saying about how important these beliefs and like how we view things, how important and how really strong that can be. Right. So before we get into, um, because I, I think what you're saying is, is your book kind of goes into dispelling some of these myths, or I'm going to call them, uh, you know, for myself excuses, uh, that I used to tell myself, cause I used to tell myself some of these things ju just to drink and use drugs. But what are some of the, the main physiological effects of, of alcohol that you think are important to note? I think that the, the, the main physiological process that goes on with alcohol kind of explains a huge amount and it feeds into lots of different areas. But the simple explanation is alcohol is a chemical depressant. It's a sedative. And when I'm using the word depressant, I'm using it in its chemical sense. So it's something that depresses or inhibits nerve activity. So that's why we tend to feel more relaxed and sometimes sleepy when we have a drink because it's, it's sedating us. But the problem is the brain works by way of something called homeostasis, which is a fancy word for just a delicate chemical balance. So your brain creates and excretes a whole range of different chemicals, drugs and hormones. And it does it to keep this very delicate chemical balance, you know, things like endorphins and adrenaline and cortisol, you would have heard of all like dopamine, all of this stuff, these are all chemicals that are created and excreted by the brain. Now, the problem is when we take a, a depressant like alcohol, the, the brain reacts to it and it does lots of different things. But what it amounts to is that it becomes hypersensitive so that it can work under the sedating effects of the alcohol. Now, the more you drink and the more years you drink for, the more proficient your brain becomes at becoming oversensitive. So it become, can become more and more oversensitive. And that is essentially what tolerance is. It's how you can drink more over the years. Your brain becomes more and more adept at countering the depressant effects of the alcohol. Mm. Now, the problem is where the alcohol wears off, your brain remains in that overstimulation phase okay. for a period and in low levels it symptoms are anxiety so this is you know the colloquial term hangxiety that anxious feeling you get after you, you've been drinking right it's a direct chemical result of the alcohol mm. and of course in extreme you know you know if you're having i don't know four or five beers you're going to feel a bit anxious the next day in increasing amounts, when you're hitting like a bottle, two bottles, three bottles of spirits, that's what you think of as that extreme alcohol withdrawal that alcoholics get. Um, it also explains just obviously this feeds into sleep, but what happens is usually it's about five hours from your last drink that that balance tips and the overstimulation kicks in. And this is why drinkers usually find they wake up four three or four in the morning and feel really anxious with their heart beating really fast that is a direct chemical effect from the alcohol they've drunk interesting interesting wow so there's a lot going on there i'm curious mm. if if you could speak to maybe the physiological side of um you know like the craving that that happens around alcohol um, yeah, absolutely. The, the cra yeah. So cravings actually not physiological. So how I like to think of it, I try and sort of separate out. You've, you've got that physiological process going on mm -hmm. where every drink gives you a feeling of relaxation, but then a corresponding feeling of anxiety. It's a simple, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But there's a lot of psychological factors going on at the same time, mm -hmm. one of which is craving. Now, People tend to think of cravings as something that just happens to you and you, you know, you, you may have a few ways of getting out of it, but a lot of the time you're craving and you just have to grit your teeth and get on with it. Right. But actually there's a specific thought process that goes with a craving. Okay. And what happens is just talking about alcohol, the thought of an alcoholic drink goes into your mind. That's not a craving. It's what you do directly after that, that causes the craving because a lot of the time what we start doing is start fantasizing about having a drink. So you actually start torturing yourself. It's like if you're really hungry and you sit there and start thinking about tucking into a burger or a pizza or whatever your favorite food is, you start to do that. 
And then the next stage on from that is where you start entertaining the possibility of having one. And then that's when you start to doubt your decision. So you say, I'm not going to drink, but then you think of alcohol and you start fantasizing about it. You think of taking that ice cold beer out of the fridge or pouring yourself a glass of wine or whatever it is. Mm. Um, and so you actually refine it because if you think if you're hungry and craving food and you're fantasizing about it, that's one thing. But if the food's actually in front of you and you're about to eat it, it's even worse. So that's actually what a craving is. It starts with the thought, but then it's what you do with the thought afterwards, which will dictate when it, whether it becomes a craving or not. Okay. Um, there was someone, I don't know if you've heard of Alan Carr, but he developed a method of stopping smoking back in the eighties. And it mm -hmm. was incredibly successful if you get into the right mindset, because what he actually did was condition people through his, either his seminars or his books, so that every time the thought of a cigarette enters your mind, you just think, oh my God, I'm so happy I'm free. I've stopped smoking. So you turn it around and people who do it successfully don't actually crave because what they're doing, the craving process, as I say, it starts with a thought and then it turns into fantasizing and then it turns into actually considering the possibility of having a drink. Mm. Now, a lot of people try to avoid triggers because it leads to craving, but right. actually it's incredibly difficult not to be triggered for drinking alcohol because True. so many people drink and, you know, the radio, the TV books, everything's full of people drinking. Mm. So actually avoiding triggers is incredibly difficult, but what can be more effective is, is to stop the, the thought from turning into a craving by not fantasizing about it. Got it. Got it. So essentially what you're saying is, is like, the trigger happens or, or that initial thought happens. And the, the point is, is to kind of cut it off right there instead of continuing yeah. to go down that path to kind of condition your mind to, uh, yeah, not, not to do that, not, not to, yeah. to go further into it and, and to really, uh, reframe the, the thinking around it. That makes sense. Okay. So, uh, you know, we said that you go into dispelling, you know, some of these myths around alcohol. And again, I'm, I'm just going to call them for myself excuses. You know, it helps me relax, you know, relax, sleep, socialize. Um, you mentioned anxiety, if you would, you know, this is a conversation. Uh, so I, I'm a health coach and most of my clients are in recovery. Um, but I do have some that aren't in recovery. And uh, a lot of them are, are about my age or a little older. And one of the conversations that because even the people not in recovery that they know I am, you know, just since I'm mm. open about it, they'll talk to me about, you know, this stuff. And even when they have a few drinks, even though they're not necessarily alcoholic or anything, they have said that like, they don't really like it anymore, because they're starting to get anxiety. So if you could, I think you already touched on it a little bit. But like, what is the effect that alcohol actually has on um, anxiety? So it does, it does a few things. The first thing is that dynamic where it's a chemical sedative. So your brain reacts to it. And when the sedative wears off, it's going too fast a, a way of thinking of it is if you're driving a vehicle so say you're sat in your car and you say i want to go at 30 miles an hour as a steady pace okay. so you're going along perfectly fine at 30 miles an hour but then you hit some mud or sand so the vehicle slows down mm. so you have to put your foot further on the accelerator to get up to 30 miles an hour but when you go back onto concrete you come out of the sand or mud the vehicle flies ahead hmm. that's essentially what your brain's doing Interesting. and that's what causes the anxiety okay so that's the first and most important thing is that it wears off so the feeling of relaxation wears off leaving a corresponding feeling of anxiety okay the other massive thing it does which isn't fully understood but it impacts, so I've talked briefly about how it impacts sleep because right. when that overstimulation gets it kicks in, it's like having too much coffee. You know, when you drink too much caffeine, one, you can't sleep and two, your mind sort of jumping all over the place and you feel a bit anxious and a bit out of sorts. It's kind of like that. But the problem is, and, and it's probably worth mentioning briefly sleep because a lot of people just think I lie down, I fall asleep, I wake up and job done. But actually, sleep isn't just about being unconscious. It's about going through different sleep cycles. Um, and there's a few different sleep cycles, and there's a lot of differentiating factors between them. But one of the interesting, one of the big differentiating factors between the different sleep cycles 
is how deeply unconscious you are. So you've got something called deep sleep, which as the name suggests, you're really deeply asleep. But then right at the other end of the scale, you've got something called REM sleep. Now, when they've studied people and put sensors on their brain and monitored them through REM sleep, their brain lights up almost as if they're fully awake. So the point here is you go through these different sleep cycles from being really deeply asleep right up through to being almost fully conscious and then back down again. Now, the problem is when you drink for the first part of the night, you're too heavily sedated to go into the higher regions of consciousness sleep mm. like rem sleep so usually you should have six or seven um cycles of rem sleep people who drink usually only have one or two so it's a massive difference and then of course after five hours it's very difficult to sleep at all and you don't go into any deep sleep so what alcohol does is completely messes up your natural sleep pattern which has a huge impact on how you feel but also anxiety levels and, and i kind of liken it to Imagine if you needed eight hours sleep at night and you went to sleep from 11 at night to seven in the morning. And that's you having eight hours sleep. Right. Imagine what state you'd be in if you set the alarm for three in the morning every night mm. and got up and drank two jugs of very strong black coffee. Imagine yeah. the effect that would have on your mental health and your anxiety levels and how you feel. That's essentially what you're doing when you drink alcohol. Mm. OK, that, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Now, you, you also mentioned this, uh, I'm, I'm going to say this was just one of the main ones I picked up for myself, the, the probably the biggest excuse, uh, or lie I told myself for so long is that, you know, drinking would help me come out of my shell and and socialize it, explain to us why that that isn't necessarily the case. Okay, so you've heard of endorphins. So these are something your brain releases to make you feel good. And it's that lovely high, or you just feel happy and good about everything. Your brain releases endorphins in a few different situations. It does it when you eat a healthy meal, when you're hungry, mm. um, when you exercise, when you have sex, and it also releases them when you are relaxed and socializing with other humans. So humans are social creatures and we get a, an endorphin reward when we are relaxed and socializing okay but the problem is we're also products of society and when we meet other people unless you're you know a raging extrovert to some degree or another you usually feel a bit inhibited and a bit nervous sure so that's usually in, in an alcohol-free socializing dynamic you will go out you will feel slightly nervous slightly inhibited but as time wears on you will start to relax into the event start to socialize and then you will get an endorphin high and you'll start to really enjoy yourself mm -hmm. now when you introduce alcohol you get to the event you feel slightly nervous the alcohol being a sedative will anesthetize those feelings of nerves and allow the endorphin rush so you get it slightly earlier but the confusing factor is because we start drinking, most of us, when we're socializing, we start to confuse an alcohol sedation feeling with the endorphin rush. So that's why so many people believe that when they drink, it makes them feel really fantastic. It doesn't. It just causes you to feel slightly dulled and out of sorts before leaving a corresponding feeling of anxiety. Mm that good feeling you get when you're out drinking with your friends is actually an endorphin rush. It's mixed with alcohol. So you do feel drunk with it, right? But the good feeling of it is not endorphin. It is not alcohol at all. It's the endorphins. And if anyone's still drinking and in any, any doubt about that, a really interesting experiment is to get what you would normally drink on a night out, sit yourself down with no TV, no friends, no music, no nothing, and just drink it. And what you find is a hugely different and frankly, not particularly pleasant experience. You start to feel slightly tunnel vision, slightly confused, and it's very hard to concentrate on anything. That's the effects of alcohol. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Well, the, the, I think the part you skipped though about getting to the party and, uh, you know, feeling a little dull is, uh, where you make a complete ass out of yourself. Uh, at least that <laughs> would be my, as well. my, my part of the story. <laughs> so uh, now you also wrote, I, I did want to ask you about this because I didn't have a chance to look into this here. So I, I would be learning a little something. You also wrote um, 
uh, alcohol explained too. So tell us about that a, a little bit. What what is different in this book, and what did you kind of uh, expand upon there? So this, I always struggle with this question a bit because it's not like one book was one topic and another was another. I wrote, I think Alcohol Explained One after about a year of sobriety. So I'd learned a lot. I pieced together a few of the jigsaw puzzles and I produced Alcohol Explained One. One of the things I did was rightly or wrongly write the book that I wanted to read. So I wanted to explain the basics, hmm. but I, I don't like, if I'm reading a novel, I want it to be really long and I like to lose myself in it. But with a self-help book, I want it short and to the point because sure. I want to get it read and yes. move on with hopefully improving my life. Yes, thank you. So I tried that. to keep it fairly short and mm -hmm. the chapter's fairly short. Okay. And when I stopped, I kind of continued to think about things and piece some things together. Um, and what I intended to do was do like a second edition of Alcohol Explained and update it with new information. But actually, when I got around to doing that, it was ridiculously long. It was another book. So it ended up sort of being a second book. So it's a Got bit it. of a mishmash in that it goes into a few things that are in the first book, but in a bit more detail. It explains some other things that are in the first book, but in a different way. Um, and it introduces sort of different information. But I think the main thing is alcohol explained almost explains where you are when you're drinking and what you need to do to get free. And in many ways, alcohol explained to sort of mirrors my own journey in that there's a lot more in there about staying sober mm. um, long term and actually trying to get the most out of life when you've got some sobriety under your belt to really start trying to open up and enjoy things more. Great. Wow. Yeah, that, that's really cool. And, and so I think that's a good segue into my next question. Um, now that you have been sober for a while here and you are, you know, getting more out of life, as, as you said earlier, can you tell us a little bit about what your uh, recovery, if you will, looks like today? And, you know, just some of the things that you that you do for yourself uh, that you feel like contribute to your sobriety. So for me, one of the big things was realizing that I used alcohol when things became tough. And I think there's a huge temptation. And I think it's OK in the first few days, but it can be damaging if you do it long term. I think when you're drinking, you become very conditioned to consuming something to change how you feel. So you have a bad day and you take a drink to take the edge off it. And there's a, it's a tendency to then cut out alcohol and then just think, right, what's the next thing I can consume to change how I feel? So people start smoking too much or eating badly or, um, you know, drinking loads of caffeinated drinks or whatever it is. So I think for me, one of the big things was finding something that I could use to deal with stress that wasn't damaging. So for me, that was exercise. Mm -hmm. So I've always exercised quite a bit anyway. Um, and actually quitting drinking allowed me to sort of hone in on that a bit more. So that's been quite a big thing for me. Um, and then I suppose the other thing is, is sort of trying to help other people to find their way out, which is something I find <laughs> quite addictive, to be honest. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So before we wrap up here, I want to ask if there's maybe one piece of advice, although I think you've shared a lot of great information already, that you'd like to share with the Sober Nation, whether it's for someone that is, um, you know, flirting with the idea of sobriety or is newly sober or someone that has maybe been sober for a little while and is kind of struggling to uh, to get what you described as, as more out of life, if there's just maybe one piece of advice that you'd like to share with the listeners? I would say quitting alcohol and all drugs allows you to mass it opens the door to allow you to massively improve the quality of your life because your brain chemistry back gets back to normal you start sleeping better your health and fitness improves and that has a massive impact on your mental resilience but i think you do it, you need to bear in mind it opens the door it doesn't guarantee it so it gives you the potential to do it um, one piece of advice i would just say to people if you know if they've quit and they're sort of feeling a bit shaky 
Um, there's something called FAB, which is fading effect bias, which is a way by which all humans look back on past events more positively than when they actually happened. So it's a universal thing all over the world, no matter what country you're from, you, there's this human tendency. We look back on the past and we look back more positively. And I think that's a massive factor for drug addiction because I think as time passes, we tend to look back at our drinking or drug taking phases more and more fondly and we start to forget the reality of it. So I would say that, and sorry, one other thing I would say, because it goes back to what you were saying, I think you need to bear in mind that every recovery, it needs to be bespoke to you. So I always say to people, it's not, it's not like a set menu. It's like a buffet. You go in, you pick the bits you like, and you, you create your own bespoke way. And it's probably not going to be like anyone else's, but don't be afraid to pick and choose what you want. Wow. I like that. Yeah. What you want. And, and I would say for myself, what, what I don't want, you know, and, mm, yeah, um, yeah. and, and I think that, uh, what, what is really cool about this and, and I think you just said that so well, I like that buffet analogy because, uh, although I decided to go, uh, a 12 step route personally, that doesn't mean that I didn't want to pick up some of the things at the buffet that your book talks about, where it's going more into the, you know, uh, the logical side and physiological side and kind of mental side of, of understanding what's really going on, because that all also helped me uh, substantially. And I, I'm sure there are other people that are that are in that same boat. So that is really great advice. I, I love that analogy as well. So you can find Alcohol Explained and Alcohol Explained too on Amazon or by visiting alcoholexplained.com. Thanks again for coming on the show, William. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Be sure to check out the show notes for all the info from today's episode. Sober Nation FM is brought to you by Sobriety Engine. Sobriety Engine is a free online community of men and women supporting each other in their recovery. Visit sobrietyengine.com to join today. This show is also brought to you by Recover Health. If you're ready to get fit and start living a healthier lifestyle while supporting your sobriety, you can learn more about having me as your own personal fitness and nutrition coach at rcvrhealth.com. And again, whether you're listening to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or watching on YouTube, please share this with your friends, follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. Nation, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.